the most exciting evolution in artificial general intelligence, that's AGI, occurred just this last month, late July, when Professor Carl Friston from University College London, but more recently also chief scientist with Versus and his colleagues, dominantly at Versus, although we're including in that group also uh, Dr. Thomas Parr and also Dr. DaCosta, who's done work with Friston over the past few years as well. So a group of 10 researchers put forth a new advance in active inference, and this is changing the AGI landscape. This is huge. But as we read this paper, and by the way, for the paper itself, for links to the paper, please go to the description box below. Click on the link to the blog post. That blog post has links to the paper that we're discussing today and a lot of other supporting papers. Very useful for you. So the paper is From Pixels to Planning. And essentially what it's doing is addressing the single greatest issue in making active inference a practical, realistic tool in AGI. Up until now, it's been suitable for small-scale problems. As examples, in one work, I think it was in 2018, that they applied AGI to the game of Doom. More recently, in a review on active inference and reinforcement learning, so it was very much that contrast and compare. Uh, it was led by Dr. Noor Sajid and others, of course. They, they used the game Frozen Lake, and they used it both for active inference and reinforcement learning, showed advantages with the active inference approach, but it was still, again, very small scaled. And during this time frame, of course, we've been seeing fabulous advances using reinforcement learning, even though we all know and all the leaders in AI are saying this is a narrow intelligence. It's not going to expand over a, a broad general scape of where we can make larger scale applications. So it's been a limitation and everybody's known it. And even though we've loved, absolutely adored this beautiful theoretical foundation for active inference, the pragmatics of implementing it have been just not quite what we'd love to see for moving forward, except until recently, until within this last month. So today, and let me introduce myself very briefly, if we haven't met before. I'm Dr. Aliana Marin, founder and chief scientist with Themesis Incorporated, founder of the Themesis Academy. I've got a long-term love for this topic. What we want to do is gauge impact, get perspective, get a sense of, you know, not only how big is this, but also what's the likely time frame for evolution? What's the, lo what's the overall impact going to be? And these are questions that we can answer today. We're not doing a very deep technical dive. We're doing a comparative uh, assessment. And surprisingly, it's not with uh, reinforcement learning or even with Lacoon's JEPA, that's Joint Embedding Predictive Architecture, that we use as sort of a contrast and compare. The thing is, renormalization group theory. It's the theoretical foundation that Friston and colleagues have used to create this new advance. And here's the thought. When Hinton went from simple, restricted Bolson machines, which he invented with Ackley and Sejnowski back in that 1983-1985 time frame, when he went from that to inventing contrast of divergence 2002, that was in about a 20-year time frame gap. Contrast of divergence was the mechanism. And then you've got to add in the fact that there needed to be the computational advances. So 2006, Hinton and his graduate student, Ruslan Salakutinov, evolved the first deep learning architecture. Now, at the very same time, again, working with Hinton, you had Alex Krzyzewski and Ilya Satskavar doing a deep learning thing that really wasn't the same kind of deep learning. It was CNNs. It was that first uh, cat image recognition task, totally different project. The thing that made both these possible in a certain way was the development of enough computing architecture to get this job done. The work with Ruslan Salakutinov gave the deep learning architectures stacked Boltzmann machines in one form or another possible. And that was 2006. 2012, you're getting an article by Salakutinov and Hinton summarizing the whole approach. 
2012, you're also getting an article hinting colleagues across four research groups looking at the evolution of deep learning in, they applied it to uh, a speech recognition problem. So 2002 is the evolution of the method. 2006 is the first illustration of the deep architectures. 2012, it's popularized. Now with Friston, first generative work, we would call that about the time frame of mm, 2010 and then 2013, 2015 for some very significant papers. There was a notational shift. There was a broadening of the conceptual nature in the 2017 and 2019 time frame. Friston joins Versus in 2022. So we're just talking a shade less than maybe two years ago. And that's just enough time for the teams to come together. Everybody needs to learn Fristonese, so to speak. They need to learn the active inference methods in some depth. And 2024, you've got this new evolution in the active inference space, renormalizing generative models, RGMs. The key thing that's allowed this to happen here is renormalization group theory. The key thing that is a very workable analogy for comparing renormalization generative models, RGMs, with the deep learning is that there were several publications beginning in 2013 and going for several years thereafter that talked about renormalization group theory as a, an implicit model or an implicit process within deep learning. So it's not at all fanciful to compare the evolution of active inference from the basic premise to RGMs, which we just now have, to deep learning going from Olson machines to the deep methods from that space of 2002 where we got the contrast of divergence up through 2006, 2012. So the fundamental physics notion that has typified the evolutionary breakthrough is the same in both cases perhaps a little bit more analogically in the case of deep learning and more directly in Friston's work, but you've got that very nice tie-in. So let's have a quick look at what this means for us. Time frame. I mentioned earlier, Hinton, initial work, 1983-1985, breakthrough 2002. 20-year gap, approximately. Friston, earliest work, Let's call it 2010, but really also sort of 2013 to 2015, a little bit over a decade ago, and then the significant breakthrough just in this last month. Depending on how you count significant papers, 10 to 14 years for the act of inference to get to this point of going from a beautiful theory up to something where you could have the ability to start looking at scale, larger scale problems and moving across both time and space. When we go to the Hinton work, the evolution, once they had the contrast or divergence to actual implementations, 2006, then to a broader adoption, 2012, was a 10-year time frame. I'm going to suggest for all of us that this time frame for the act of inference evolution at the at-scale level is compressing the evolution that deep learning went through from 2002 through 2012. In other words, that we can say took about 10 years. I'd say that when Friston teamed up with the researchers at Versus.ai and of, of course brought with him some uh, colleagues that he'd been working with for years and years, and so it wasn't entirely a cold start, but there was definitely getting a group up to speed. That's been about a two-year time frame. So we're looking at a con condensation of what happened in the deep learning era that took the theory to fairly wide practical use. That was about 10 years. And now we're looking at Friston, active inference, going from theory to, to practical implementations of about two years. In other words, from the time that Friston would have joined versus .ai to now. So what we're seeing is remarkable compression of the evolutionary timeline for development. We're seeing more people involved at the early outset that are giving some juice to this. When we had the case of the deep learning evolution, it was Hinton and Salakutinov. And there was a, a six-year gap 
between the early Hinton and Salakutinov work and the widespread adoption where you had, say, a, a paper that was coming out representing the point of view of four different groups on the same methodology and the same practical application. That stretch from 2006 to 2012, it's been hugely condensed. Right now, that, that whole step, both the theoretical evolution and the bringing enough people in, an or, in fact, actually an order of magnitude jump in the number of people, 10 people in this latest publication, that's an order of magnitude jump as compared to the early Hinton work, where it was Hinton and then Salakutinov, just two people involved. So what we're seeing is a expansion of the number of people involved, a compression of the timeline. What does it mean? <laughs> Very pragmatically. Let me just consult my crib sheet here and share a few words with you. So Fristin and colleagues describing this as generalized Markov decision processes as discrete models. I want to make a quick little contrast and compare. Lacoon in his JEPA, talks about the need for a differentiable system. So this is discrete, discrete models. It's chunkier. It's not a smoothly differentiable system in that same context. So there's a comparison of the substrate. In active inference, we're looking at discrete models, something where you can take things through a Markov decision space over in JPA, continuous. When you say differentiable, there's that implication that you've got a continuous model. In the active inference world, it is very definitely, very explicitly a generative model. And in the JEPA, as Lacoon keeps making the point very clear, not generative. So there's these two different opposing points of view. And then with this active inference, with this RGM, renormalizing generative model, very generative, Friston is making the point that we random dynamic systems of sparse coupling, sparse coupling, and an implicit Markov blanket partition. When you've got these two conditions, the random dynamic systems, sparse coupling and implicit Markov blanket, and this notion of the implicit Markov blanket, that's been part of the Friston thinking ever since 2010, 2013, 2015. This is, this is intrinsic to the work, okay? Then he says that we can start to pull in this renormalizing approach. And that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Like when you have these partitions in the system, then you can view them as being coupled across units of space and time, and that allows us to pull in a renormalizing approach. So yes, what we've got is a significant advance in AGI. The playing field is now no longer what I'd said previously in a YouTube where I was referring to action perception divergence, which was a theoretical step. I, th I still think it's incredibly important. We'll be talking about it. I hope to bring us all through a, a little tiny bit of a um, worked example, something that we can all do just for fun. So action perception divergence still important. And that was led by Hafner and colleagues, a conclave of persons that were working together. But they were keeping that to a strictly theoretical conceptual evolution. Now we're seeing a group of people that are dedicated to making this real. So what do we have? Yeah, something that is absolutely, it's a breakthrough moment. It's taking us into a, a new playing field where people are First of all, working on, an, on scaling the whole active inference so it's no longer a desktop, very limited capability model, but we're looking at bringing it into larger scale, both across spatial applications. For example, they were dealing with images and image recognition and uh, video image recognition and generative models within image and space. And then, of course, planning, looking at a, an Atari game, uh, and we can expect that that will be scaling up rapidly in the future. So we've got that as one platform for AGI, and then the other one is JEPA. And you've got different bases for each of them. I'd say that the world of AGI just got very, very real. My personal response here, <laughs> my personal response, is that I am so absolutely delighted and thrilled for Professor Friston, for the people who've been with him for a while, Dr. Parr, Dr. DaCosta, 
who are new colleagues out of Versus.ai. I'm so delighted to see this new work come out from you folks. I'm looking for many, many more, more evolutions to come. And we're wishing you all the very best with this new evolution. It's such It actually just brings joy to my heart to see this paper come out. We're so pleased to have this evolution for you. So congratulations, kudos, delighted with what you got. Looking forward to the next steps. To, to all of you who are catching this video, what we want to talk about in the near future is education. How are we all going to collectively come up to speed? I'll bring that into the next talk, but today we're just going to uh, crown the Christian root with laurel leaves and, and uh, pat them on the back and be just extremely thrilled for their accomplishments. So thank you, everybody. Once again, Aliana Moran from Themesis. Have a lovely day.